Welcome to another episode of Sisters in Conversation. I'm your host, Develo Motani. I'm an attorney by profession and the founder of a platform called Sister in Law, which is a platform dedicated to empowering women through legal education. On today's episode, and in celebration of Africa Day, which will be on 25 May, I'm joined by Ruth Tanui, who is a practicing attorney um, based in Nairobi from Kenya. Ruth, welcome to the show. Thank you for agreeing to have a conversation with me. Thank you for having me. It is really honestly so lovely to have you. Um, but how I like to, you know, get to know my guests on the show is that, can you please start from the beginning? Tell us about Ruth. Where did you grow up? Where were you born and raised? Um, were you raised by your parents, raised by family? Do you have any brothers and sisters? Um, just tell us a little bit about your early childhood. Also, okay. My, uh, for me, I was, I was raised in a village in Kenya. It's called Molo. It's next to Nakuru town. Mm -hmm. I, I have six siblings, two sisters and three brothers. Um, I was raised by my mother and my father. So you are the last born? No, I'm not the last born. I'm the third born. Okay. All right. Six children. Yes. Okay. And, and raised my, by your parents? Yes. I was raised by our, both my parents, my mom and my, my mother and my dad. Yes. Mm -hmm. What was growing up like? Um, You say you were raised in a village. What, what can you just, you know, for us who are not familiar with the village, what kind of, um, childhood was it is it dusty village um is it those villages where everyone is strict everyone in the village is your parent and you're scared of all the adults what kind of experience did you have yeah so it's it's a very typical african village where like people the one we see on tv tap, yes where you <laughs> what there's no running water in the tap you go to the river to fetch water Mm -hmm. So like, that's the kind of village you go to the forest to fetch firewood. Like, yeah, yeah. Village. Yes, but it was uh, my childhood it was a, a very happy childhood because mm -hmm. um, as much as that, our parents kept us rooted and they made sure we had all the education, like the best education they could afford to give mm. to us. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's lovely. And what is your what is one of your best? Um, memories from your childhood, like that memory that you just always lean back to. Can you just take us back to that day? So, okay, my I think I can say my best memory as a child is if, when my dad would come back from work when we were kids, and then he would bring us like sweets, like any this snack. I think that was my best memory. Yeah. Like, I think that those are one of my best memories because we would he used to have some some small car. So when he comes home, we would all go and all the kids would go and surround him in the car. And then yeah, he yeah. Music and then we would be there dancing. That's normally my best memory. I love all that. So was he yeah. was he staying with you at the time, or would he come like once a month or something? Yeah, at the time, most of the time he would work late. He was he, he would work late, so he would come home. There was a, a period even he because of insecurity he would had to sleep at work, so he would come maybe on weekends. So that's mm. why I yes. The, but then when my father literally worked hard to give us a good life. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So that's why I normally appreciate I used to appreciate those moments where now when my dad would come and we would all surround him and we would catch him up with what has been happening throughout the week and everything. Okay. And school, how school has been. Yes. I love that. So your your father was working full time and was your mom a stay at home mom or was she also working? No, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. And up until our last born, my last born brother went to boarding school is when now she started doing business. I think okay. they were trying to keep us a balance because my dad was most of the time working. So they, want, they wanted at least one parent to be full-time at home. So that's yes. why I, I feel we had that balance. We didn't feel as though we lacked anything because both parents yes. were present in their own way. Yes. Yes. And then um, tell us a little bit about your, you know, university life. How did you decide um, on which university you wanted to go to for starters? And then how did you ex become exposed to the legal profession? Did you, did you grow up, you know, looking up to somebody in the family who was an attorney? 
or did you see something on TV? What inspired you to pursue specifically a law degree? So from for my high school, I studied, I didn't study in Kenya. I studied in Uganda, our neighboring country. I did my okay. high school in Uganda. Yes. So after after in, during the what part, what made me want to study law first? Let me. I think I can start there. Is I remember during at our home there was a time there was insecurity, so we we were attacked by thieves. Like they broke into our house. Mm, and mm. L- luckily, nothing bad happened. But I remember during that time, I felt like the the system, the police system, and everything wasn't working in our favor. Because even mm. the police took long to come, and there's nothing much. We didn't even have like I, I felt justice, even no justice was done. Of course, they stole something. Yeah. So yeah. I think from yeah. then, as a young girl, I think I was almost thirteen years. I knew I wanted no, I from that time I felt like I would not want to be in this position. I would want to join the uh, to be in a position where I can do something about what's happening. Mm, mm. That's why in my first practicing years I did criminal law, a bit of criminal. Yes. And then oh. for uni- for high school, I went to Uganda, our neighboring mm-hmm. country. Then uh there is all, for them they do all level and A level, but in Kenya we only have all level. So mm-hmm. during my A level I majored in uh, in units that will direct me to doing law. Then upon finishing, I remember it was in 2010, we were just having our new constitution in Kenya. So okay. I that's when I made, and yeah, I made the decision where we were getting out the new constitution in Kenya. And then I just thought about the fact that if I study law in Uganda, now Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda, I won't be able to, you know, I want to learn this constitution of uh, like the Kenyan mm. constitution. That's mm. when, so you can practice at home. Yes, that's when I made the decision to come and study law in Kenya. I remember coming because I studied on my high school. I was I asked my elder brother, which is the best university in Kenya for studying law. According to my brother, it was Moy University. Mm. So I applied. I applied to Moy University, and by the way, I was I was risking it because since I had not studied in Kenya, because when you study in Kenya, you you have like almost six a, a lot of options of universities you can join. If you don't get this one, you'll oh. get to this one. But for mm. me, I had made that decision. So I just applied to more university to study law. And but luckily I, I was I got admission to more university. Is there is there was there a reason why you studied specifically in Uganda? Do you have family there or you were just interested in, you know, moving away from home and being a little bit independent? No, the reason I studied in Uganda is because after my primary school, a friend of my dad. A friend of my dad was told my dad like Uganda. Let like, I'm going. I'm taking my kid to Uganda, and I think it's a good opportunity. And mm. I think my dad just went with him to look at the school. It's a school called Saint Lawrence High School. It's in Kampala, Uganda. It's an international school in Uganda. A boarding, and, a boarding school. Yes, a boarding school. And my dad saw that that can be a good opportunity because it's a it's a school where people from all over. Africa, they study, they do their mm. school there. Mm. Yeah, so that my dad, so it can be a good way. Me and my that, me and my brother can go and study there. So that's why we went there. Mm, okay, and then, and then tell us a little bit about you know um your your memories from twenty ten when the new constitution was coming into play. What were some of the exciting conversations that you were having as you know law students? Um in the new dispensation of, of Kenya, if I can put it that way. So I remember the most contention was on land, on the issue of land. Because even I remember there's a politician, I, I don't, let me not mention names. Mm-hmm. There's a politician who is majorly from my tribe and where most of the people around me support, like they support everything that he says. He was actually against the constitution. That's where that Point. He was again us having a new constitution, and it did not make sense to me because I knew, because you know, the the other constitution was made by our the, our colonizers. It was mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it was more. If you look at it, it's me. I find it was just so summarized. It didn't look at the interests of now Kenyans. So mm-hmm. I was just curious as to why he was going against it. Because me, according to the now the I was the way I was looking at it, I felt it it made a lot of sense. It had yeah. focused on yeah. human rights, especially Article 27 now on discrimination. Mm. It get, there was the right of expression, right? So I didn't get so I according to him, he was against the he was telling people the issue of the land part. 
land in Kenya, because land by day in Kenya, I don't know even in South Africa, you have issues with land, the system acquiring land, a lot of people get conned because of the, mm. the system is not well articulated. So most mm. people lose money when it comes to purchasing of land, and then there's grabbing of land by the politicians and all that. So for him, he was telling people, he was against that bit of the land section. But for mm. me, when I was looking at it, I felt like, of course, it won't be perfect. The first constitution won't be perfect, and there's the mm. option of mm. amendments and everything, but it is a first step to independence. So I remember those were, were, were mm. one of the conversations that were happening during that time. But luckily, the constitution went through. Sure. And is that where you started, um, you know, uh, shaping your interest? Is that is that the time that you started being becoming interested in the issue of land? Um, I noticed in your bio that you've also authored a book called Simplified Legal Process of Buying Land in Kenya. Is that where your love for the topic um, sprung from? Yes, yes. That's where my my interest began from. Because even mm -hmm. in our fourth year university dissertation, I I did a, my dissertation was majorly on illegalities of acquisition of land in Kenya. I focused on mm -hmm. land. That's mm -hmm. where my interest began from. Yeah, from even in in university, I made I, I my interest basically was on the issues of land. Mm. So and then what's the process in 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 Kenya once you're done with university uh, how do you then get admitted as an attorney do you have to serve articles somewhere or do you have to write further board exams after university what's the process So in Kenya after the pro after process of when you're done with the university there's the Kenya School of Law everyone must you will make an application. Everyone, for you to become a, a, a practicing attorney in Kenya, you have to go through the Kenya School of Law. So mm -hmm. upon completion of university, you make application to the Kenya School of Law, which is, you get a diploma. It's a one-year course, one-year mm -hmm. period, but you get a diploma. So when I was done, we made application to now the Kenya School of Law to, for one year. Then after now Kenya School of Law, you do pupillage under a, a a lawyer and and for, for them, but for you, I know you say attorney. For us, you say an advocate of the high court. So you practice mm -hmm. under an attorney for, who has practiced for over five years for a period of six months. Okay. Then yes. Then after that, now is when now you apply to be to be to be on the role of advocate. Now to basically to become a practicing attorney in Kenya. That's normally the process. Okay. So there's no. So you are saying that there's no differentiation between advocates and attorneys in order for you or you're saying that in order for you to become an attorney you have to practice under an advocate who has yes. been who has been an advocate under someone who's been an advocate for five years yes for us when you are when you're now practicing attorney you somebody we, know, we call it you become an advocate of the high court of kenya okay so that's your your similar you are you are similar to your practicing attorney. For us, we call it an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. Okay. So even that's why for me, I call myself an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. Mm, mm, then for mm. the, before you become an advocate, you just, we, the term we use is a lawyer. You just, you're a lawyer if you're not yet admitted to practice in Kenya as an advocate. Okay, all right. So what were some of the challenges that you encountered during, you know, those initial six months, the transition from law school to then, having to be in practice um, under that, you know, stewardship or supervision of the advocate? What were some of the challenges that you experienced? And maybe I want to say, did you experience any challenges specifically as a female? Um, are there any patriarchal challenges um, in the legal profession in Kenya? Can you just take us through some of those nuances? So, okay, so after university, now getting to Kenya School of Law, some of the challenges for me I experienced, and I think people who did, you remember now my high school, I didn't do it in Kenya. So yes. for the people who didn't study, yeah, so that's now some issues that happen at the Kenya School of Law. My high school was not in Kenya. So that's some of the challenges for me personally I experienced. Together with people who didn't do university in Kenya, but now want to come and practice in Kenya and are applying to the Kenya School of Law. So, they normally want you to get your results to be converted to the Kenyan system to see if actually yeah. even before you joined the university, you had the marks, which I find it to be 
like you know it's very unfair can you imagine after you have finished campus when you go to the kenya school of laws they deny you entry claiming that you are, you are not qualified to actually study law in the first place and you have already yeah. finished four years so yeah that's some I, did, I actually you know, did want to ask you earlier whether you had to convert um your ugandan uh you know transcript in order to access you know university so so thank you for touching on that <coughs> sorry so yeah i had to convert it before i'd been admitted to the kenya school of law so mm -hmm. to apply, it, there's the council of legal education you apply through them they're the ones who do you give the ones who now like they convert it through of course through neck then now they'll send a after after the conversion of, they'll send a letter now to you which will take to the Kenya School of Law stating that for you you, have, you are qualified. Then mm. for the people who are not qualified, I had a friend who also studied in Uganda. After the conversion, they were not qualified. They some even had to go to court. Some to make an application. To to mm, mm. Yes, to make an application. And then some, some then but there's also the option of Luckily enough, now Kenya School of Law now nowadays now is now an entry exam you will do. You are mandated now. They make you do. You don't have if you have studied in Kenya and you 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 apply and you have all the documents. You don't have to do the entry exam. But now there's mm. not an entry exam that has been introduced. Whereby, for instance, now if you studied out of Kenya and the the conversion is done, the conversion is done and you didn't qualify according to the Kenyan standards. Now they make you do some entry exam before now mm. joining Kenya School of Law. Yes. So, but Kenya School of Law was tough for the one year because you know you're supposed to do nine units. I've not had anyone who has who has had a good experience. All my friends and all the people studied with Kenya School of Law sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if in South Africa you have such if there's um, such a school where everyone has to go through. Yes. So for us, in order to get admitted, you do have to, as an attorney specifically, you do have to do two years of articles and articles just entails you working at um, a law firm. Law firms, obviously they vary in sizes from big law firms to small law firms, but you have to complete your two years of articles. And then you do have to have done law school for a period of, I believe it's six months, um, for a period of six months. And during that law school, it will be preparing you for the board exams that you write. So in those in those two years that you you are doing your articles, you also then write four board exams. And then once you have completed your two years of articles and also passed all four board exams, then you do your application to court to be admitted as an attorney of the high court. And then if you want to be admitted as an advocate, um, I'm I'm not well versed on the process, but my understanding is that you have to do a year of pupillage, um, and you'll be in chambers, so basically under the supervision of 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 senior advocates, and then after you've completed pupillage, there's also some uh, board exams. I think it's called the bar exam. They write the bar exam, and once they've then qualified and passed that bar exams, they become admitted as advocates. So there are two, yeah, there are two basically branches you are an advocate or you're an attorney of the high court you are able to convert later in your career if you wish to practice as an advocate or if you now wish to convert from being an advocate to an attorney so both the advocate and attorney are people who can appear before court and argue and so with advocates they are the 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 litigators they are the ones who get the brief from attorneys. And once they've received the brief from attorneys, they are the ones who ordinarily go argue the matter in court. But if you're an attorney, you also can apply to court for what is called right of appearance. And that right of appearance will allow you as an attorney to actually go and appear before a judge or before a magistrate. But with an attorney, that appearance is not automatic like it would be with an advocate who is now um, admitted as an advocate. Okay, so now I see the differences. But there, there was a time me and my colleagues were trying to see the differences between attorneys and advocates in South Africa. Because mm -hmm. for us, it's either you, you're an advocate of the high court or you're not. There's yes, no yes, I, I understand your, yeah, I understand how your process goes as well. Um, And yeah. yeah, it's quite interesting. I love these kind of conversations because it's always an opportunity for us to learn and to, you know, also educate 
the listener, especially on the different um on 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 the different methods of practice in the jurisdiction in the different jurisdictions of Africa. So thank you so much for enlightening us. Yeah, yeah. Thank you also for clarifying that point. But I've always been wondering the difference between the two. Because sometimes when, when you're looking at lawyers who are practicing South Africa, you follow them online. Someone is like, mm. attorney, the other person is an advocate. So you're wondering what's the difference. Correct, correct, yes. And then um, yes. after after your six months and after admission, um, I think I came across a post of yours where you said you left work to go start your own firm. Um, yeah. I think that's... So, can you tell us a little bit about that time? What were what were the challenges that you're experiencing that if they were challenges or you know what motivated you to start your own practice and 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 how has that experience been for you? So I I finished now though I told you I became I was not, I was not admitted as an advocate in 2019. So upon mm -hmm. my admission I upon my admission I was working in some law firm. As we call it, we normally call that period holding over before you, when you're just awaiting to be to become an advocate. Okay. So during that period, so the lawyer was working under. I I, I was under the assumption he will take me up, and after I get admitted, he will uh, employ me as an advocate under his firm. But I remember he called me after my admission. He called me and he told me I won't. I can't because you know that means I have to be paid more money because now you're, mm. you're actually now you're going to be an associate in the law firm. So mm -hmm. he said, at the moment, the firm can't afford an advocate. So we, the best I can do for you, because I remember what he told me, the best I can do for you is maybe give you space if you're looking for clients. So by then, that was now a challenging time, because now that meant, it's something I didn't expect. Mm -hmm. So even for a period, I remember for a long, a, a certain period before, I, I was just, I, you know, because you didn't know where to begin, so I remember I would just stay in the house trying now to see what options. I remember I was mostly relying on my dad. I would call my dad yeah. frequently and tell him things. What about that friend of yours? Doesn't he know that lawyer trying to get me? Then I remember my dad once told, one day just told me, you know, money cannot come and look for you in the house. You yeah. have to go out there and start. So that's that's when I began now hustling. Like we call it freelancing here, freelancing okay. basically, because not. You already, you know, you can appear before court. I'm an admitted attorney, so that means even though I get a client, I can still go before court and defend them. Even so, though, even though you were not yet admitted, or is this now you were? This no, is this now is after, after you were admitted. No, this is not after admission. Okay, all right. After admission, after admission, now in 2019, that's after admission. So that means I can still go before. I can still represent. I can represent clients. But you're so freelancing. Where, freelancing means that you're not under a firm, correct? You're just working for yourself. Yes, I'm not under a firm. I, even myself, I don't have a firm. So, like, I'm working myself. Okay. So that's, where right. I, so, that's where I started. So, I started. And I knew the best place to start. I don't know how the criminal system works in your country. But now, the criminal, when it comes to criminal, even be, appearing before court, most things are oral. Like, you even come on record orally. You don't have to do an appeal. To, to file a notice of appointment. Okay, to, that's interesting. Yes. Mm. Yeah, most things are done orally. So I knew I don't have to, you know, it's the easiest way to freelance. Mm. So that's why I started here. By then it was a real hassle because I remember you could, you had to go to the, you know, now you go for criminals, so you have to go to those who have been arrested. And then you ask them, do you have representation? Someone will be like, no, I don't have representation. We, I tell you, I can go and represent you for you to be given bail or bond, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you can handle the case on your outside, then you tell them the, the fees you're going to charge them. That's how I began. So at first it was hard, because even those people, you know, most of them, they're actually criminals, so they lie to you, okay, you represent me, I'll pay you later. <laughs> so you go, cause, but then for me, I started literally from scratch, because I didn't even want to appear for the first plea taking, because now from the plea taking stage, now when someone had been brought to court, the mm. stage. I didn't know what I'm supposed to say before court. So I listened to the advocates who went before me, what they said, then I just repeated what they said. Oh my goodness. Okay, okay. Yeah. Learning on the job. Learning on the job. It was <laughs> literally learning on the job. But at least after some time, that is 2019. So with time, I, you know, the, with time now, since you are going there frequently, you even get the police that don't call you. There's someone here who's looking for an advocate. Yes, you become friendly. Yes. Did you did you yeah, ever so experience did you ever experience um being 
undermined by the people that you are going to represent. Um, let's let me speak specifically about maybe uh older men. Did you ever feel undermined that they would worry about your competence and be like, well, what's this young girl gonna do for me? You know, will she be yeah. able to represent me well in court? Um, and then you know, you you go to court and you blow their mind and they are now like, wow, okay, what a what a what a competent and what an exceptional job you've done. Did you ever experience that? Yeah, constantly, especially in that field on the freelance stage. Even you find someone sometimes, you have already approached them, they have already, they are okay with you representing them. The, the moment a male advocate comes in, they switch. They switch immediately. Oh, they are like, yeah. now, now you find someone being like, no, I've decided he's going to represent me. Because mm. already they feel like, of course they won't tell you, but by that action as in itself, it's unspoken, but you already know it because you're a lady. They feel like yes. you're not competent enough. Yes. Yes. And then there's even some, they actually, now, yeah, they, they let you represent them. Then later on, they'll be like, you've really done a good job. I didn't expect that. And also, talk, they, they'll just be, someone will upfront tell you, like, me, I didn't know you're going to do I was even worried I'm going to be taken to jail because mm -hmm. you're not going to be competent enough. Then I've, I think ladies, may I from my experience, it's harder for ladies compared to men in this profession. It really yes. is. Yes. Especially yes. in some now, especially the criminal part and some areas especially. People find that they feel as a woman, you know, that you won't give the same competence as a guy. And it's after now you have represented them and they see that you're doing a good job is when now they feel now more confident in your representation. Mm, mm, mm. So Women. And so, yeah, what are what is what what is one of your best memories in court during that, you know, during those first few months of freelancing? Where, obviously, sometimes you also not sure of yourself, but um, can you think of one one um appearance where you won and um you were just really feeling proud and feeling that okay, I can do this, I can definitely do this. Yes, I remember there was a time I made. The best memory I remember is for this. this it's, it was a foreigner who had been arrested, an mm. Egyptian client. So for him, he had been arrested because his his visa he had extended his visa. His visa had already had already expired. Okay. So the, he had been he had been brought to court because you know there's the under our constitution you you can't hold a person more than twenty four hours. Okay. You must bring them to court within that period of twenty four hours. So he had mm -hmm. been brought to court, and then the the investigating officer who had brought them brought him to court it was claiming they have not finished the investigation, so they were they wanted to hold him for another fourteen days. So for me, I was me. I found this to be like it's infringing on his rights. Yes. You can't bring. Yeah, it's already clear what you are supposed to charge this person with. The, the mm -hmm. fact that you are asking for more time is just infringing on his own rights. So I remember I argued in court. I went to court and I argued in court and I told court that my my client has his even as much as he's not a Kenyan, he has his rights. He has human rights. Mm. He's not supposed mm. to be held with the, And first of all, he doesn't speak English because the person who who gave me instruction was his brother. His brother was okay. the one who stayed in Kenya for longer periods. So for mm. him, by then he didn't speak English. I even had to, to present. We had to talk through his brother. Mm. And court by then did told the IO, you either, we are, this, we are this, you can't hold this person further. So tomorrow morning, if you're not bringing in a charge against him, he's supposed to be released. Mm, and they, mm. released, they released him immediately. Because sure. they knew, because it was just a visa, he had to just apply. Even he had started the process of applying, it was just some delay. I remember yeah. that is one of the, because you know, I feel when you, you are fighting for, you fight for someone, right? So I feel sometimes people's rights are infringed. Because mm. they are maybe unaware, or maybe some institutions can take advantage of and because of the language barriers. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So I felt mm. and I remember he, the the brother and now them, they were so happy they could not believe that that was even possible, especially for them being foreigners. And, and what I can also say is they paid me good money. <laughs> you know what? That's always a good, a good motivator. Um I really love that. I love that story because um, part of the reason why we do what we do is really to give everyone access to the law and um, fair, uh, fair justice being served. We want to see justice being served. So um, I really love that. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, 
when did you then decide, okay, I need to stop freelancing. Now I, I'm ready and um, confident to start my own firm. And how was that process for you? Yeah, so the reason, you remember for me, that I, did, I, I didn't get a place immediately after admission. I didn't have a place. So, of course, even at that point, it's more of also I didn't have the finances to start my own firm. Mm, mm, so mm, at least mm. after freelancing for now a year, in February 2020, now after a year, I at least I had gotten finances. At least also I had clients. At least I began getting some few clients here and there. Mm. So that's when I, I now started my, I decided now to officially start my farm. Luckily enough, in Kenya, starting your farm, when you're registering your farm, the law Society of Kenya has made it so easy. So I didn't experience, on that aspect, I didn't experience any challenges. Because I remember mm -hmm. in Kenya, when you apply, just like you have to register just like a normal company through the, mm -hmm. the normal channels. But now they, for them, they normally require a letter of no objection from the Law Society of Kenya. Okay. Before they officially okay. register your company. So when I, I remember when I, I thought now that is going to hold me back, but I remember I went, their offices are just here in Nairobi. I went to their offices and I got it. Within 30 minutes, I had the letter. Because mm. they just check in their system if you are a registered advocate, and then I think I got the letter of no objection. I uploaded it so that at, at least that part there was no much challenge. Mm. 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 Yes. Now, of course, now the struggle now comes in. You are a young lady trying now to convince someone. You know, now people the way we were talking about when it comes to female advocates, people view it differently. Yes, absolutely. They, they we have the same problem yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's a global thing. We are yes. yeah. it's more of a global thing when it comes to women. We have to work triple hard compared to our um, male but I, also feel as, but I also feel as women, sometimes because of the societal, everything that has happened in the society, their women are looked down at. For some reason, it has subconsciously gotten to you. So that's why you sometimes even, the, you lack the confidence. Mm. yourself because you know, so you you, find sometimes you're, you're right you're right these yeah. are society, these are structures that exist in society through um through religion through cultural practices through our traditions um through so many other avenues that started before even corporate before we even got into our professional spaces there was already um patriarchy religious based um patriarchy cultural traditional practices so yeah there's there's quite a lot of systems that we have to fight with us it's also over and above being a woman is being black because our our profession is still very very much um you know gatekept by white old men so it, it, we have quite a lot of barriers to get through to just prove and assert ourselves as women in in corporate South Africa and in the legal profession. Yeah, which is so sad because I even heard there's a there's someone who reached out to me, some lady, she she wants to start her own farm. So she was telling me, because I think she was admitted two months ago. So she was telling me, I feel so inadequate. I feel so yeah. I don't have that. So I was even I was telling her, sadly, as women, you'll find a guy who wants to a, a man who wants to start the same person who won't have the same challenge. Yeah, I won't feel the inadequacy. So I was telling her, you already have what you just said because I was telling her, you, you know, before you become an advocate, you do a lot of things. You have practiced under another advocate. You have done so you can't be saying that you're inadequate. Yeah, no, yeah. But, mm. yeah. So sadly, for women, women, we, there's that. But now, for me, what I I came to realize that so freelancing helped me to get the confidence because I knew, especially in the yeah. legal profession. Confidence is everything. Remember, you're convincing this person you want to represent them and you're going to give them the results mm. they want. Mm. The and then you have to convince the judge. <laughs> you must yeah. convince your client so, and you must convince the judge. <laughs> yes, so there's like the co confidence is something even that is like you can't do this profession without the confidence. Mm. So in 2020, I started my own farm. And luckily enough, ever since that, they, of course, there are a lot of challenges with starting your own practices. The, and you started it just you started it around the time of COVID. How was how was that? What were no, the challenges no, like? Of... By then, during that period, I started it during COVID time. In, because mm. I remember COVID in Kenya now completely started now. Even the lockdown started now in March, just a month yes, after I started yes. my farm. 
but and even courts were closed. You know, that's something that I'd never imagined in, in my life that one day I courts can, will be closed. I can only imagine, yeah. Yeah, definitely. We didn't see we didn't see COVID coming. We couldn't have ever imagined something on that magnitude. Yeah, so you see now that during that may and then now I think even everyone in you know, all over the world are expecting that maybe by next month it will be done. Be yeah, done the COVID yeah. Is back to normal. Yeah. But of course it's stretched. So for me, what happened, of course, now because courts had been closed and there was lockdown, so of course you wouldn't go to work even to the office. So during that period, I won't lie, it was so hard. And then I remember even in just around August. August, so because COVID started in March, around in Kenya now it became so serious now in March 2020. So mm. around August 2020, I remember there's a mentor of mine, a, law, a, a lawyer, a, a senior lawyer who just called mm. me and was like, I remember there was a time you're looking for a job. There's this law firm that they handle my properties. And there is a, it's a big firm. I've spoken to the owner and to the managing partner and he, he told me to send you for you to, you can send your CV for you to go mm. and work there. Mm. So you know that time I just started my farm. Finances, of course, were not the were looking not good. good. Yes, yeah, because yes. you have not been working. The savings were running out. So I considered that, but still deep down in my in my heart, I just still wanted to fight. I used to call, I call it my baby. You I didn't want to let go of your baby. To, yes, I know exactly yes, what you're talking know. about. <laughs> So out of respect, I just, I was just like, let me send the CV to now this managing partner. So I sent it. I, I remember I sent a, an, an, a CV that I'd never edited since 2015. So I just forwarded it to him just so that I can tell her. I even texted her. That, that you did you it. Yay. I've already done Yay. it. But your heart, your heart wasn't in it. <laughs> yeah, my heart wasn't in it. I, but now this man, the managing partner called me by the way, and he's also a senior advocate. So you know, he called me and he was like, You have sent me a CV, but what have you been doing since 2015? Because then now I, I then I, I told him, let me then he was like, amend it, I'm waiting for it in 30 minutes. Mm. So I quickly, so I quickly called a friend of mine who I know she's normally good in these things, and she edited mm. it for me, and then I forwarded it again. But in my 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 mind wasn't even in it. Yeah, then the next yeah. day, I was called now from that farm telling me there's an interview the next day that I should be there at by 10. I should be there mm. at 10 a.m. in the morning. But I still, I even told myself I'm not going to go. I still, I, I feel, I, I was still feeling like I still make this work. As much as things are not looking good, even mm. in the country, courts even had, uh, had not started opening up. So I was just like, I can still try. I want to fight for my baby. <laughs> Yeah, but when 10, I didn't go, but I knew, of course, if you miss an interview, it's like you've lost that job, you've lost that opportunity. Mm. But now the, the managing partner called me and he's like, we, are, we have been waiting for you, where, where are you? Then I lied to him. I remember just, was just but he was like, we are, we'll wait for you at 2 p.m. But then I went for that interview, but I didn't even prepare for it. I just went, I didn't even prepare for anything. I didn't even know any, much about the farm. I didn't yeah. know the background for the farm. I just went out of respect. I'm like for my mentor and now this senior advocate. And now they've and now but, they've actually given, you know, they've changed the time from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Now your excuses yeah. have run out. So you just have to go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I went for the interview and like and then I knew I'm not even I remember that time I sat in a chair that I was fidgeting, my mask, <laughs> and then I thought there was just I you were just not I there, you were not present, like yeah. your heart was not in it. I I know yeah. exactly what you mean. <laughs> Yeah, my heart was not in that. I knew this is not. I still, you know, in the back of my mind, I was like, I can still make my farm work. I can't. So how did you get? Living. How did you get out of that fix? What happened after the interview? What did they say to you? But, but how... sh shockingly, they called me the next day and told me I've gotten the job. I should start on Monday. That's not what <laughs> you wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah, it's not. But I was just like. For, let me go for a short period, maybe by, I was not counting, maybe by October, things will have gone back to normal, then I can mm. now. The good thing is you can give your notice for resigning, and then now you mm. I go back. But yeah, I actually went, and but I think everything is also God's plan, because I remember in that farm, the lawyer, the managing partner more majorly focuses on conveyancing, the, now the mm. land issues, the one where my interest is, and mm. he has over 30 years experience. So I remember he even took me under his wing. We could go for marketing in these banks now to when people are taking loans and putting land at security. We would go together for those marketing. He would take me to this meeting. So I learned a lot. I, by, by then I worked, I only worked for two months and I quit. 
I resigned. But during that, had you learned? You know, had you learned enough of the convincing process in those two months? Yeah, I felt I had already. I learned. I had learned enough. And also, mm. the way I was telling you, my heart was just for me to go back and work on my farm. And mm. I think, and I think during that period, yeah, I learned. I learned much from that. And I, I thank God for him also because I learned a lot from him during that period. Because we would work with him together most of the time. And also he would give me, I dealt with transaction for a lot of money, which I would not have dealt with when in my small farm. In your small firm. I farm. like that. I love that. So when you yeah. when you are an advocate, you can automatically do conveyancing work. You don't have to write any further exams to qualify as a conveyancer. No, no, no. You can't. But then basically in Kenya, so if you're an advocate, you can handle any matter like this. No, so you know, for you already have audience in court. Now, maybe now you might mess up your client because you're not well versed in that area, but appearing before court, you'll appear before court. Even tax, you can do tax matters. You can do, because you have audience in court. You don't have to actually do something else further. Mm, okay, interesting. So, yo, for us, if you want to be a conveyancer, you have to write um two exams, uh, paper one and paper two. And those exams are very, very difficult. Very, very, very difficult. The pass rate is incredibly low. Um, in previous years, the pass rate has ranged from 9, 15% to 20% um, overall. But this year, uh, this year, the most recent exam, the pass rate was 0.25% nationally. Well, that's too high. And why? So for even for if you want to be a tax lawyer to practice, no, tax, you so have to for, an exam. no, for us it's just um conveyancing and notary. So if you want to be, so you can you you get admitted as an attorney, and then if you want to do conveyancing, you have to get admitted as a conveyancer, but you must write those exams, you must pass those exams, and then if you want to be admitted as a notary, you also then have to write the notarial exam to get admitted as a notary, then you can do notarial work. Okay, that's interesting. For, Ken for Kenya, it's different. It's very different. You don't have to do... Like for me, the only thing I did is now follow the... That's the normal process. Go to Kenya School mm -hmm. of Law, mm -hmm. do people just like everyone else. There's nothing mm -hmm. unique you have to do differently. Mm -hmm. yeah. but so after... Yeah, so just going back to your story, after the two months you left... And then you started, sorry, I'm just looking at your bio as well. Um, you left and then you started your you went back to your firm. You went back to your baby, I guess. Um uh, but now you went armed with your criminal law experience and the new um experience in, in property and conveyancing. Is this also around about the time you wrote your book? Oh yes, because now I wrote my book. I wrote my book. I was it no, I wrote my book I think a year later. So it was around twenty twenty two. Around February twenty twenty two. That's when I wrote my book. Sorry, when you went when you went when you went back to your firm, you were now just focusing on conveyancing when you went back to your own firm. Yes, I was I was they were, you know they have told you as in Kenya, you I you know you you, you can do any area of law. Mm -hmm. And now you mm -hmm. know when you're starting out, you don't have a lot of like you don't have the luxury of being choosy. So sometimes a client will come in with a, a uh, matter that is in, yep. def, in, def, in a different area. You know all about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is so true. So during that time, yeah, as much as also I was also focusing on conveyancing, I would also do other other things. Like that's even when I even went into family law because I would get people who want a divorce, children matters. So those are the matters I was also handling when I went back to my farm. So I, I in my then now after that now during that period and you know for me i also do articles in my website because i have my law firm website on land mm -hmm. matters mm -hmm. yeah doing mm -hmm. land matters because I've, I've even so far and luckily enough one of the things that happened that is i could they the one of the biggest newspapers in kenya invited i've invited me i think so far thrice to do an articles on issues of land and property in kenya mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that gave me exposure it gave me some expo it, it gave me exposure and it helped me in getting clients also to my farm so have you ever um, had an encounter with the politician or the 
the the the gentleman you say was fighting the constitution in 2010 um pertaining to land matters have you ever encountered him since in your career no i have not i have not yet encountered him but i would just by the way encounter him i think that's the question i will ask him i'm still curious to this day why was he mobilizing people to say no like i would just want to know the exact thing this is it was a mm -hmm. good move from and you know nothing is also perfect. We had the option of also we can amend the constitution as time goes by. But mm. I've never, I've never encountered, I've never encountered him. All right, interesting, interesting. And what has been, what has been the stand um out moment for you uh in 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 running your law firm? I I know we speak about the challenges, but what are some of the proud moments of? of pushing through, you know, um, listening to that voice within you and just going back to your practice and, 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 and really giving it your all. What are some of the proud um, memories or some of the, the, the great achievements that you can share with us? So my biggest proud moment is through me starting my own farm and going on my own, I managed to build my parents a home. Oh, I that's, love that. I okay, that's, that's, that's uh -huh. big. That's big. Yeah, that was that is one of my proudest because now because you know your parents focus on educating all of you who are six kids, mm -hmm. so they think and they don't think about themselves. So I was like, mm -hmm. I just want to give them a good home, mm -hmm. a comfortable mm -hmm. home with modern now modern. I told you I come from the village with modern facilities where running water, everything. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that was the, my biggest. And then now the opportunities that now going on my own like now for instance though i've told you i got a chance to do newspaper and uh, newspaper articles mm. and and also but this one is now most recent most recent also i got i've gotten opportunities also to appear on national tv to share legal my legal expertise so i, I can say those it. are most of the yeah, most and of you wrote a book. Me. And you wrote a book. Yes, yeah <laughs> and i also wrote a book. So i'm thinking you know what i I think people, it gave me the confidence of believing in myself. It made me believe mm. that, you know, if so long as you set your mind to something, you can mm. actually do it. Yes. Mm. And like, they don't, you don't have to let other people who, who pull you down, even though you are a woman in this profession. Mm. Remember, you do the same exam as everyone else, even though then you're saying now oh, there's also the rest, the racist in part, racist in part where they, if you're black in the legal profession. Mm. like people look down on you but remember if people do the same exam everyone does the same thing i think yeah. believing yeah. it gave me the now confidence of believing in myself and such yeah. opportunities coming your way it gives you the like now the confidence like mm. you're doing this you're doing the right thing and for and i think and also me i am a big believer of religion i'm a christian and i believe mm. putting god first in everything that you do like everything will just fall in place I love that. I love that so much. Ruth, thank you so much for sharing your story with us, for sharing your expertise with us. In these last five minutes that we have, is there anything that you'd like to say to, you know, a young girl, um, a young woman in the legal profession who's listening to, to our conversation today? Um, do you have any words of encouragement for that young listener? Or is there anything of interest, really, that you'd like to share with us that I haven't asked you about? Yeah, so I think I to the younger listening to your podcast, or even though you're not in the legal profession, for me, mm. if you have a dream, you want to, if there's something you have a dream in you to achieve, so long as you set your mind to, I normally believe the universe will always adjust. Like, think of, so long as you set your mind to it, and put in, of course, all the work, and all the, the universe will always adjust. You'll achieve it so long as you set your mind to it. And also believe in yourself. Remember that not someone will not make you believe in yourself. It has to be within you. Learn to don't talk down on yourself. Learn to encourage yourself. Yeah. So me that's what the advice I would give. Like whatever you can you whatever you set your mind to, you can do it. And also another thing is just know life is hundred percent your responsibility. You can never control the outside or what happens, but you can control how you react and adjust to anything. Mm. That's mm. nice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. I think the one of the you know things that stood out to me towards the end of our conversation was how you just said something so important that I've never really had to think about. But you said 
we all wrote the same exam. So at the very least, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. be confident that you all wrote the same exam and the fact that, you know, we are able to um, pass those national bar uh, or board exams that we write. Um, you you are already qualified to be in the profession. We all wrote the same exam. So thank you very much for that reminder. I love that. <laughs> thank you for having me. By the way, what you are doing is great. I, look, I, I remember when you, when you reached out, I looked at your profile and what you do. This is something that we really need as a continent. Like, the way you are bringing, and then you bring in women who share their their journey. So you know it helps young women or even people. It makes you believe that if this person has done it, also me, it means I can also do it. That is so true. Representation absolutely matters. Um, I just noticed now that I had also wanted to speak a little bit about um your platform uh that you founded, lawyers helping each other, and 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 I like that. Can you just tell us a little bit about the work that you do under that platform? Yeah, so okay, I started I started the lawyers helping each other based on my own experience. I realized after now after pupillage during that period when I was looking for a job, I realized first of all it was even hard. You know, it's normally easier. You don't have that connection. You're not from a, you know, a wealthy mm. or well-connected family. So you don't have that experience. The, the networks. Yes, yes mm. the network. So that's why on that page, I normally share job opportunities that are found, it's, that have been shared. I share job opportunities on that platform. And then we also have conversations on maybe I share my experiences and also other advocates share their experiences. Like for me, I share my experience of starting my own farm, telling people that it's something, you don't have to have a lot of capital to start your own mm. farm. You're gonna, mm. Someone like me, I'm an example of someone who started basically from scratch. So it's basically giving, it's, I, I like calling it a little icon on the internet, which gives now the lawyers and the advocates uh, like something that they can at least see, to connect, to relate to, so that you don't feel like you're doing this journey on your own. Mm. You feel at least to have a community, a, a community that you are working, you work with, you are working around with. So that it's a safe space that I created where lawyers basically, basically from the name, they are help, lawyers are helping each yes, other. Yes, so yes, people, yes. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I love that. It. I. I do see the similarities. And I love the word that you've used when you say community. Um, like I said to you at the beginning of our conversation, that is the point of sustain law, you know, just to have built this community where as women in the legal profession, we can depend on each other and reach out to each other for, you know, assistance, for mentorship, for guidance. So thank you. I, I, I love the work that you're doing. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Also, me, I appreciate that you had me in your... That's why I said yes. I told you I... So the first time I heard about this interview, I had it through. There's a lawyer I follow. I don't. I don't even know her personally. I think she. she there was a time she had a YouTube channel. She was sharing her journey. Yes. So yes. I like looking at lawyers from different areas of Africa and also even the the US continent, like what they are doing and how it is for them. If it's the same. Yes. Yes. But then, I, so that's why I. The moment you reached out, it was not the first time. But it's like what you are doing is. Great. Good. Thank you so much. Well, Thank you. you so don't much. never get discouraged. Never stop. Thank Just know you are a lot of people are listening and they are seeing and it's impacting. Thank you. I will definitely keep pushing. Thank you, Ruth. Um, like I said at the beginning, I hope this is not the last time you and I will be speaking to each other and that we'll continue to be friends online and and, and reach out to each other for whatever we need. Yes, yes, yes. Most definitely. At least now you, if, uh, anytime, even if maybe even anytime you may get a chance to come to Nairobi, you can of course reach out. You are the first person I'm calling. <laughs> yes, yes. You are the first person I'll call. Don't, don't even worry about that. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, Ruth, enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, you too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.